Well, it's good to be back in the pulpit. It's been like a medical sabbatical. I've had a lot of time to really focus on my relationship with God. It's one thing to prepare for all the things you do, but then to sit back and read and really spend time focusing on God. And so I've enjoyed that. And so for our camera people, my wife has told me not to be a hero. There's a stool here. And if I need it, I may sit on it because I'm not sure how, if I can stand 35 minutes yet, we'll see. All right, take your Bible. We're going to talk about salvation is by faith alone. Continuing our study in Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Let's look at verses uh, 6 through 12 for our scripture reading. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Verse 11, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the, righteous, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we come before you today, and Lord, I'm an unworthy servant to share this message. Thank you that you, you use forgiven sinful men to proclaim your word. And Lord, I pray that as these words go out, they wouldn't be my words, but they would be your words. That you would open our hearts and lighten our minds through your Holy Spirit to learn, to dig deeper, and to become more like the Savior as a result of our time in the Word. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stop for a moment and remind ourselves what the book of Galatians is all about, where we are and where we're going. This is all the way back to the introduction that we had in week one of this study. Merrill Tenney, who's a wonderful New Testament scholar, said Christianity might have been just one more Jewish sect, and the thought of the Western world would have been entirely pagan had it never been written, speaking of this book. Galatians embodies the germinal teaching of Christian freedom, which separated Christianity from Judaism, which launched it upon a career of missionary conquest. It was the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation because its teachings of salvation by grace alone became the dominant theme of the preaching of the reformers, end of quote. The theme of this book is that Christ followers' deliverance from the bondage of sin and legalism, leading to a life of freedom in Christ. And that's a tremendous purpose and power of this book. And the outline to this book, a simple one, we see in chapters one and two, it was to share the true gospel and to identify Paul's authority as an apostle. We looked at that. We studied that. <clears throat> in chapter 3, Aaron got us started with verses 1 through uh, 5 to understand how grace and law interact with the gospel leading to salvation. And we'll continue to see that through this chapter. But then we get to chapter 4 to understand how the Christ-following Jews and Gentiles act as one in Christ. As you know, the Jews were commanded for years not to have anything to do with the Gentiles. Now in the church age, we'll talk about this in a little bit, Peter and Paul begin to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And how are these two believing groups come together? He talks about that in chapter 4. And then 5 and 6, to culminate it, he takes and applies what he's taught in these first four chapters so we understand the contrast of walking in the flesh and walking in the Spirit. The key verses for this book are these. Number one, Galatians 5, 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He also deals with the Spirit working in our lives. In verse 25 of that same chapter, chapter 5, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And in Galatians 6, 2, we have a responsibility as believers to one another, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ in Galatians 6, 2. As I mentioned, Aaron did a masterful job speaking the last two weeks on law and faith. 
And uh, as we're explaining in Galatians 3, not only about what we rely on for our salvation, but how we live out the sanctifying process of how we're becoming more and more conformed to Jesus Christ and how we look at the law and how we look at grace. The law is powerless to save us and change us into the image of Christ. So this morning, we're going to look at and be reminded that we're saved by faith alone, and then we continue to grow in Christ, separate from the law, but in the Spirit. Why do we keep beating this drum? Well, as I've said before, there's something innate about us as human beings that we want to do something to earn our salvation. It's the American way. We want to be educated. We want to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We want to be able to say, we did it. Was it Frank Sinatra that said, I did it my way, right? We want to be that, that kind of person. But it's foreign to mankind to have someone as gracious as a loving Heavenly Father to show mercy and compassion and be willing to provide a way of redemption so that we could be saved and re- receive eternal life from Him. I don't know about you, but sometimes it sounds almost too good to be true. But for that and other reasons, man thinks they have to pay something or do something to merit salvation and to keep meriting acceptance by their God. As you study world religions, anthropologists, sociologists, missionaries who've happened on people, tribal people that they've never encountered before, they find two things. One, that they worship something. They haven't been educated. They just know innately they're to worship something. Second of all, there's a need to sacrifice to whatever God it is that they're worshiping because they see that they're not equal to or they have a problem or there's a sin. And so something has to be done. In the Hindu religion, the Hindus believe they go to the Ganges River once a year and bathe themselves and cleanse themselves from sin. In Buddhism... They have this thing called asceticism. Asceticism is doing extreme extreme things to your body to keep the fleshly passions and desires under control so they can break the cycle of reincarnation so they can become one with Brahman. They'll sleep on a bed of nails. They'll sit out in extreme weather with little or no clothing. They'll do things to try to control their fleshly desires. Mormon missionaries, when they're teenagers... Upper teens, they're required to go out for two years on missionary journeys to proselytize people as part of their works to earn their salvation. We think of Jehovah's Witnesses. Even the famous Michael Jackson went incognito and went knocking on doors because he wanted to earn the ability to be one of the 144,000 in their religion that they believed uh, you had to earn to get salvation. They go out, they work. But the good news for Christianity is that Jesus paid it all. And when he said it is finished, God's wrath was satisfied and God turned away from just being a judge to where his son became the savior and the intermediary for anyone who will confess Jesus Christ as savior and come to God on his terms. The purpose of this message, every Christ follower must learn to walk in the spirit by grace through faith rather than carrying the responsibility to obtain merit on their own from God. Let's look at our first point in the outline this morning. Mankind cannot do enough by obeying the law to merit righteousness from God. Walking in the law. Next week, we're going to unpack the New Testament believer, Christ followers, perspective on how to look at the Old Testament law. There's a lot to talk and unpack with that, but today we're going to look at how we cannot be saved or walk in righteousness if we are continuing to walk in the law. Galatians 3, 6 through 9, just as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. A point under there, some point, the law does not bring God's blessing, but faith does. Paul is quoting Genesis 15, 6, in chapter 3, verse 6 of Galatians. Abraham 
had very little revelation of God. God came and directly talked to him. He didn't have a written word. He didn't have a church, a synagogue, or anything to go to. He didn't have the resources that we have today, but he acted on the little bit of revelation that he had, and it was because of that God saved him because of his faith. That's how Old Testament saints became believers. They accepted the revelation they had and the prophecies pointing forward to a deliverer, Isaiah 53 and others, that would ultimately come and be the Messiah to save the Jews from their sins. Think about it. Abel, Noah, Moses, they had little experience with God and yet they were committed to him by faith. All three were justified, counted righteous and accepted by God because of their faith in him. And that's why they're recorded in the Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. It was their faith. Those who believed by faith, Jews and even Gentiles in the Old Testament were considered righteous and believers. Notice in this section of scripture, Galatians 3, 6 through 9, he talks about blessings to all nations through Abraham. That means Gentiles as well as Jews. Gentiles would not be under the Mosaic law and the Mosaic law had not yet come to the Jewish people anyway during Abraham's lifetime. It was by faith they became children of Abraham, not relying on the works of the law. The gospel is promised to come through the Jews. And as we see in Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10, the uh, vision where the, you know, the cloth, the blanket comes down and God reveals there's no unclean person. No unclean animal. And Peter and Paul, the, book of re- the rest of the book of Acts, go out and preach the gospel to the Gentiles so they could be saved. And it all becomes, comes through the avenue of Abraham's faith. Second of all, under this point, the law demands perfection. Perfection. Deuteronomy 27, 26, which is quoted in this section of scripture, cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of the law by doing them, and all the people shall say amen. In Matthew 5, 48, you've heard me quote this numerous times. Jesus said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Guess what? I don't measure up on any day of the week, okay? We have to be perfect without any breaking of the law if we're going to follow the law and be accepted and given righteousness. James 2.10, forever keeps the whole law, but fails in one point, has been guilty of all of it. As I mentioned yesterday, if we tell one lie, we become a liar. If we steal one thing, we become a thief. And we do that because we have this innate desire from original sin that we're born with to do these things. These verses are not meant to discourage us or remove our hope. They're to give us the opportunity to drive us to the arms of a merciful and gracious God. And we live by faith and we live upon dependence upon God's forgiveness and grace to stand on because we are united with Christ. You see, every morning in humility, we rely solely upon God as we go through our day. I have a sign in my office, start every day with a grateful heart. And when I open my door, I see that sign when I come into my office. And I'm thankful because I rely on God for my food, for my clothing, for my shelter. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, you don't see the birds worrying about where they're going to get their food or God's going to take care of them or the flowers. We don't need to because by the grace of God and humility, we depend upon him, upon his grace. He provides the emotional support and strength we need for what we will face throughout the day. The Holy Spirit gives us the mind of Christ and God's perspective. None of that the law is capable to do. Here's an example, a car mechanic. You take your car in, you got a problem, the check engine light's on or whatever, and you go to uh, the mechanic. And he runs a battery of tests and he comes back and here's the prognosis. Here's what's wrong with your car. That's an example of the law. The law is given to show us where we don't measure up to God. Our prognosis is bad. We got a problem. But then if we decide to go ahead and say to the mechanic, go ahead and fix my car, we trust him by faith using parts and his labor and his knowledge 
to service our car and make it to be able to run as well. You see, the law brings us the problem, but the grace of God through Jesus Christ brings us the solution, the power by faith. It's faith in the solution, God's grace that saves, that takes over where the law leaves off. But I want to point out the law is good and not sinful. The law is good and not sinful. We're not trying to denigrate or put down the law. The law has a very important purpose. In Galatians 3, 10 through 11, as we continue on in a section of Scripture, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. That's from Deuteronomy 27. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Literally in verse 10, it's talking about those who are of the law, those who are walking in the works of the law. The Jewish legalists who wanted all believers to follow the Torah, to observe all the traditions, the feasts, and laws to maintain acceptance and righteousness with God. Paul says in Romans 7, what then shall we say, that the law is sin? He says, by no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, And through it killed me. So the law is holy. He's saying it's good. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. See, the law is not sinful. But the law is like a mirror in James 1 where it says we are to look intently into the law of liberty and not be just a hearer but a doer of the word. It says in James 2, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, if you see the law and you aren't doing it, but if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has been guilty of all of it. The law is to show us our condition, to point out when we do the good things, but also when we fail and fall short. In Romans 8.3, Paul said, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, because we are born with a sinful nature, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. It took Jesus to come and fulfill the law. It took Jesus to teach us to see light from darkness. It took Jesus coming and preaching to reveal sin, and then eventually the Holy Spirit. It took Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection to solve the problem of sin, that the law revealed to us. Another point, the law is necessary, because it's good, necessary to bring us to Christ. God uses it in a powerful way to show us our inability to do it ourselves, but then to bring us to the, to the foot of where the solution to this problem is. In the Old Testament, God commanded that the Jewish people needed to sacrifice a lamb or goat to receive a covering over all their sins. In Romans 3, it says, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation or a payment by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine patience, forbearance, he had passed over former sins. In the Old Testament, when you sin, the family would bring a a lamb or a goat to the synagogue and they would have it slaughtered and that blood would cover their sin. And that's the key word, cover, cover their sin. In the New Testament, the sins are not only forgiven, but removed. When Jesus said it is finished and we trust in him as Savior, he takes away our sins. They're no longer just covered, but taken away. As far as the east is from the west, cast into the deepest ocean, for God to remember them no more. 
In Galatians 3.12, it says, but the law is not a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. You can live by the law. You can try to continue in your Christian life to uh, follow these things and, and uh, do them, but it's not going to give you the power and the ability, uh, and you already possess the things that are necessary. You don't need to gain any more acceptance from God. It says in Galatians 3.10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So the problem is laid out here in verses 10 and 12, an issue of how one will live their Christian life after salvation and walk in righteousness. See, first, I would say, eight years of my Christian life, I lived in legalism. I thought that every day I got up, you know, I went to Christian school. I had to go out on weekends and share my faith at a shopping mall and pass out tracts. And every night I would go home and I would think about, did I do enough? Did I do enough to please God today? And it wasn't until I came to the place of realizing and understanding that God can't love me any more than he already does, than he already did before, than he already will in the future that he accepts me as I am, not because of what I've done, but because I've trusted in the grace of God. And so if we as a legalist try to go back and live a Torah-based life to gain acceptance and righteousness from God, we will live a Christian life unfulfilled, unassured if we're fully loved by God, striving to do more and more to where we get, as I did, a burned-out Christian life, that you can't do it. A caveat here now, I want to say we can learn from the feasts. We can practice the feasts. We're getting ready to set up a Seder meal here uh, on one of our Sundays. It's important to look into those things. It's not wrong to celebrate the Sabbath. But the point is, what is the purpose? Those things all point us to the grace and the finished work of Christ. If we're doing them with the motivation to gain more acceptance with God, and to feel like that we have to do that in order to maintain our salvation, then that's the wrong motivation. The problem with this approach to the law, keeping and legalism, is that it leads to pride. What I found out in legalism, it leads to pride. I can remember meeting on Thursday nights for visitation, and somebody said, where's Joe? Well, he's not very spiritual. He's not here tonight that we go out on visitation. And you begin to have a condescending, negative attitude in legalism. This creates a spirit of negativity and judgment and doesn't unify the believers in the church. This is where the Pharisees were, praying and thanking God that they were not like the Gentiles. They thought they were above them. They were very condescending. So legalism can be done in a perfunctory way of carrying out and doing the works of the law. But Isaiah 29 says, And the Lord said, Because... This people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and the fear of me is a commandment taught by men. We can do all the right things. We can check all the boxes. But if our heart is not where it needs to be, then we have the wrong motivation. Instead, we're to come in humility, to admit daily that we are a sinner in constant need of the Savior. We daily sin. We daily depend on God, his Holy Spirit, and his power to sustain us. Listen to how we should approach our Christian walk every day. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You should go home today and do a word study in the Greek on the word poor. Poor means you come to God destitute, desperate, needing him. Poor in spirit. Second of all, in John 15, he said, Abide in me and I in you. We're to rest in him. To rest in him. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice how Jesus describes himself gentle, lowly, willing to take your burden, your work, if we trust and rest in him. I think a great psalm you ought to memorize, and I need to memorize this week, is Psalm 123 too. 
It should be our daily attitude toward the God of mercy and grace. It says, Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to our Lord, to the Lord our God till he has mercy upon us. We look to him daily in dependence, standing on grace through faith that we have received. And that God will give us that present grace, that future grace. And it says that mercy that's available. In Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it says God's mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness to bring them to our doorstep every day and to provide what we need to face the day. So our application here is doing to earn salvation or increasing our acceptance by God is futile. We can't do it in our own power. We can't do it in our own ability. We're never going to measure up. And that's a hard thing for us sometimes to, to accept because we're strong, we're proud. We want to do it our way. We can never hit the target because of our sinful nature, because we like to rebel naturally against God's laws and commands. Our second main point today is this, that mankind must put their faith in the finished work of Christ alone to receive Christ's righteousness. We have to walk in the Spirit, not in the law, for a victorious Christian life. Galatians 3, 13 and 14 Paul says, or Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. All who rely on the law are cursed, according to Deuteronomy 27, 26, Galatians 3, 10. The truth of the statement is confirmed in Habakkuk 2.4, the blessing comes by faith. It cannot come by obedience of the law. It says in these verses, 13 and 14, through Christ's crucifixion, Christ redeemed. That word redeemed means to buy someone or something out of a dangerous position. To buy believers from the penalty of the law, the curse. To buy back someone who's a slave to sin. Christ died to buy us back from the bondage of sin. The curse of the law. This is God's pronouncement of condemnation, of judgment because of our sin. And Christ became the curse and took our condemnation. Thus the blessing that was promised to Abraham, including the Holy Spirit, as we see in Galatians 3.2, comes to all who have faith, even Gentiles, as we see in verse 14. When an ancient criminal back in Old Testament times, was condemned to die by the Jews, they would be stoned and then after death would be impaled or tied to a post until sunset. Now here's an important thing to remember. It was not that the person became cursed because he hung on a tree, but he was hung on the tree because he was cursed already. Let me make that distinction again. It was not that the person became cursed because he hung on a tree, but he was hung on the tree because he was cursed already. These verses say that Jesus became a curse. He was not cursed like a criminal, but he took on the sin of the world to satisfy the wrath of God. And in doing so, he became a curse so you and I could have eternal life to be saved. In 1 John 2, 24, Jesus himself was the substitute for our sins. He took our place. He bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. If you know Jesus as Savior, you are healed spiritually and will be continued to be healed spiritually. But you see, the Jews struggled with their Messiah becoming cursed. To the Jews, the cross was the final proof that Jesus was definitely not the Messiah. In 1 Corinthians 1.22, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness or folly to the Gentiles. In verse 14, you should underline two of the most beautiful words you will see. For us. Jesus became a curse for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal 
life. Romans 8 says, He who did not spare his son, but willingly gave himself up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? For us, Jesus did that. Two benefits of Jesus becoming a curse. One, salvation would come through Abraham, the Jews, and eventually would be sent to the Gentiles. Two, the Gentiles as well as the Jews would receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We see that in Ephesians 1.13, Acts 1, 4 through 5. Note that these two things are received by faith based on the works done by Christ and the cross and the power of his resurrection. So we're left with this, done versus doing in our Christian walk. Resting and abiding in Christ versus works of the law without confidence and assurance. And as a result of our faith in Christ and his working in our lives, we look at these following thoughts very quickly as we bring this message to a close. New Testament Christ followers walk in the power of the Holy Spirit by grace through faith. It says in Romans 7, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to Christ who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way, in the new way of the Spirit, and not the old way of the written code. New Testament Christ followers walk in the righteousness of Christ given to them, given to them, given to them at conversion. Paul, in Philippians 3, he would show off his pedigree. He'd say, I'm a Jew of the Jews. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. The law, blameless. But then he gets down to verse 9 of chapter 3 of Philippians, and he says he would give it all away and consider it rubbish. In verse 9 he says, And be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, that depends on faith that I might know Christ and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. New Testament Christ followers walk in grace. In grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God has been revealed, manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Even though the law and the prophets had the law, they saw something greater down the road. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, a satisfier of the wrath of God, the payment for our sin by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine patience, forbearance, he has passed over former sins. And here's the key, verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just. Remember, God is just. He's a judge. He has to judge it fairly. Because he's holy, he's righteous. But the good news is he's not just just and condemned sin, but he's the justifier, as it says, of the one who has faith in Christ because he sent his son to pay for the sin. He was the judge, but he was the guy that provided the solution, the payment for that sin. That's key. That's how we walk in grace. Another point, New Testament Christ followers are justified by faith in Christ alone. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And then New Testament followers are led now by the law of Christ. We'll talk about more about this next week. What is the law of Christ? In Romans 3, Paul said, now what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works. No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one 
who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then overthrow the law by his faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law of faith, the law of Christ, grace through faith. Trusting in Christ, finished work alone, and its subsequent benefits to us that are ongoing. So here's the application. Living in peace that Christ did the work necessary for salvation is freeing. It's exhilarating. It's like walking out in fresh spring air, feeling freedom. Living in peace that Christ did the work, we are free. He accepts us just as we are. Even in those days when we feel like we've sinned so much, how could God forgive me? He still loves us. He still accepts us the same. He accepts us just as we are. We're going to talk next week about the New Testament, Christ followers' responsibility to the Old Testament law. That's very important. That's something I have wrestled with in the 52 years of being a Christian. And we'll talk about that next week and then have discussion in our connect groups to wrestle biblically with that topic. But here's our key thought as we close today. Rest as you joyfully walk in the Spirit and the power of imputed righteousness. Imputed means righteousness that was given to you, that you didn't earn, but was given to you. Rest as you joyfully walk in the Spirit and the power of imputed righteousness. Here's three questions to ponder, to meditate on. Do you think about this message this week? Are you at peace trusting in Christ's finished work to obtain and walk in your salvation? Can you walk out saying it is finished and I'm going to walk in the Spirit and I'm going to live for Christ, but it's not because I have to. It's not because I've got to do things to please Him, but because of His grace. Second of all, why may you feel at times that you need to do the work of keeping the law to gain more acceptance from God? We need to think about that. And thirdly, how can you rest this week in the fact that God loves you just as you are today? The motto for my alma mater, Liberty University, which was founded in 1971, is to be champions for Christ. I heard that through chapel. I heard that through my classes during my time there. We're to be reminded in Romans 8.37 that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. As we walk with and worship Christ, we're guaranteed spiritual victory. We need to walk as champions in Christ because of the grace and the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. Max Lucado gives an excellent illustration in his book, The Glory of Christmas. He talks about a fictitious story that he made up, but drives home a great point. An ice skater's at the World Championship Games from America. She's competing against the best ice skaters of the world. It comes down to the last round and she's getting ready to make her final uh, skate to see if she could win this thing. She's in first place, but she's nervous. She's scared. She's afraid she's going to mess up. She's frightened. And just before she's ready to go out on ice to skate the last round, her trainer comes and says, guess what? The judges tabulated all the scores, and no matter how poorly you do, you're going to receive the gold medal. You cannot lose. Now, how do you think she's going to go out and skate? Timidly? Is she going to go out scared? No, she's going to go out courageously and confident because she's going to go out because she already knows that she is the champion. Guess what? You and I, we're more than conquerors in Christ. We're in the season of being champions. As we step into all that God has for us, it will be exhilarating because the victory has already been won, which is why we can think and act from a place of victory each and every day. Let's bow for prayer. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've been struggling, wondering if you can keep up with all the expectations of God and what he says in his word and the law and the commands. Maybe you feel like you fall so short. How could could God even love me? Cling to his promises as we shared today. He can't love you any more today than he did in the past and he will in the future. You're a child of the king. 
God wants you to live as champions, walking in his spirit today. Maybe if you're struggling, you say, Lord, help me. Help me to walk in that victory today. Help me to set aside these feelings of feeling inadequate, of not being able to measure up, and to accept the fact that I am a child of the king. Maybe God's wrestling with you with that. I encourage you to pray and ask God to put those thoughts away. And focus on being a champion for Christ today. Father, we come before you. We thank you that your word is counterintuitive to our culture, counterintuitive to our makeup as sinful men. But Lord, it gives us the power and the sufficiency to be saved and to be given merit, as we sang in the first song, be given the merit of your righteousness. But more than that, you give us the ability to live and to please you and to honor you. May we find it as a joyful relationship instead of a perfunctory routine in our lives this week. May we find joy in living for you. We pray and ask in Jesus' name.